Maybe don't fear your AI overlords. Go to a nightclub instead. Motley Fool Money starts now. Welcome to Motley Fool Money. I'm Deidre Bullard here with Jason Moser. Jason, how are you doing today? Hey, doing great. How about you? Doing great. Good. Well, the big news today was Amazon investing up to $4 billion in Anthropic. So, Anthropic, the open AI rival uh, created by former open AI employees, this is a deal that includes Anthropic using the AWS cloud, of course, and Amazon's training chips, uh, which are named things like Trinium. Uh, <laughs> what do you think Amazon is hoping for with this deal? Well, I mean, I mean, they're they're certainly looking to to make inroads in in the AI space and sort of establish their own little their own little corner, right, of, of dominance, so to speak. And and that's, I think, you see them getting in there with their own chip designs, right? I mean, like like you noted, I mean, they're they're going in there and using their own chips in order to to be a part of this. I mean, I think it's it's interesting to see OpenAI. You know, all all of these are connected, right? I mean, there are all yeah. these former executives from 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 OpenAI, and they're all kind of going their separate ways. And, and so you see Amazon making its own uh, little bet here in Anthropic. I did a little digging. I was looking at Anthropic because Anthropic is not a publicly traded company, but it's interesting to see the other investors in Anthropic. Because it's not just Amazon in this case, right? Google is an investor in Anthropic, Salesforce, and Zoom Video Communications as well through their ventures arm. So again, you kind of go back to how these are all connected. I think it's very, very interesting. I do think that Amazon making this investment with the goal of of using their chip designs, right? The the Tranium chip, and I think there's another chip design yeah, in there as well. Inferentia. Yeah, Inferentia. Yeah, Inferentia. That's it. Um, that I'll be interested to see sort of how that plays out against Nvidia, right? I mean, that's kind of their answer to all of this Nvidia hype, and and, and so I, I think it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because you know. Just because you have all of the money in the world, companies like Amazon and Apple, and I mean, designing chips and then implementing those chips to do very specific things is very difficult, right? We're seeing Apple having a lot of difficulty in designing that modem chip that they want to be able to stick into their phones and ultimately displace their relationship with Qualcomm. Right. So I, I just think that's a little bit easier said than done. But generally speaking, I, I, I like the idea. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's interesting the uh, the interconnectedness that you mentioned. It reminds me a bit of you know, but what we saw before the dot com bubble. You know, it, it's all happening in uh, San Francisco again. Uh, you know, I mean, Anthropic is uh, leasing uh, Slack's former HQ. All of this seems very connected, and I'm an old PR person. I like to look at the bottom section of the press release where you see the like about Amazon and about Anthropic because it tells me not what the company does, but what the company wants us to think they do. And they call themselves Anthropic. They call themselves a safety and a research company. And they say their AI assistant, their big AI assistant is Claude. And Claude uh, is focused on being helpful, harmless, and honest. <laughs> If right. They, if they say it enough, <laughs> then maybe it'll be true, right? Right. This feels like a "Don't fear your ro- robot overlords" line to me. So, is does AI need spin at this point? I think it does to an extent. I mean, it's it's funny what you said about the bottom of the release. It, it made me think of like when you interview leadership of any company, right? Their one job is to just to tell you how awesome they are. Yeah. And, and at the bottom of this release, right there, it seems like their one job is really let's assuage any concerns that people may have regarding AI and the potential drawbacks. We're we're honest, we're safe, we're careful, and all that. I don't know that that necessarily is going to cut it. I think it's going to take a little bit more than just that. And in time is something I think ultimately that that it's going to take. When you look at um, the general sentiment sentiment out there with with consumers, isn't all that great when it comes to AI right now? If you look at Pew Research, um, overall right now, fifty two percent of Americans say they feel more concerned than excited. About the increased use of artificial intelligence, you have just ten percent saying that they are more excited than concerned. But what's interesting here, the share of Americans who are mostly concerned about AI in daily life, it's up fourteen percentage points since December twenty two, twenty twenty two, when just thirty eight percent expressed that view. So the trend 
is, is going in the wrong way, right? Mm-hmm. Americans are becoming more and more concerned about the drawbacks and risks of AI as opposed to the opportunities. And, and that's going to be something that's going to be very difficult to balance because as, as the you know, social media kind of things, information moves just at the speed of light. Not everybody's fully honest out there. You get all sorts of funny stories and disinformation and misinformation and, and things that can you know lead you down rabbit holes and conspiracy theories and whatnot. So it, it, it is it is a I think this is going to be a, a long term trend that is going to be full of challenges and, and it's going to take a lot more than just language at the bottom of release to make people feel better about the the potential positive impacts that AI can have on our future. Yeah, and and to throw it back to the to the early aughts again, it's we we felt the same way about the internet. You know, there was a lot of concern at the start of the internet. This is going to be a bad thing. This is going to put people out of jobs. This is going to. It's going to end the world, uh, you know. I mean, we're seeing that with 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 AI. Certainly, I was reading uh, Wired's uh, all AI issue uh, this weekend, and the 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 you know it it was very everything from like the world is going to end in eight years to <laughs> this is going to make a sort of new utopia. So you know, opinions are all across the board. The the <laughs> the disparity of the outcomes is 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 impressive. I mean, it, it, going from from uh, a panacea to to full on world destruction. I mean, you can't get much more polarizing than that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I want to pivot a little bit to talking about another part of Amazon. Uh, we may have an end to the writer strike, hopefully, fingers crossed. So, but meanwhile, let's talk about Amazon Prime. So, Amazon announced on Friday. They kind of snuck this out. They're adding ads to Prime. They say not a lot of ads, not just just a few. Not nothing to worry about here. And you can opt out of the ads for about uh, two ninety nine, about three bucks a month. So it's small, but you know, two hundred million Prime users. That that does add up. What do you think? Are you are you paying for the Amazon uh, ad free tier, or are you going to wait? I probably won't. I, I I don't know that I use Amazon streaming enough to really justify that. But honestly, I don't know that they want us to pay to opt out. And you know, we've seen from companies like Netflix and, and, and Walt Disney here over the last several quarters, they've been talking more and more about these ad supported uh, options that they've introduced into their models. And and ultimately, those ad supported models can be more profitable for the businesses, right? So they actually like being able to incorporate ads as long as consumers will tolerate them because they can be very profitable. And consumers will tolerate them, particularly on a global basis. When you look at the ad advertising supported video on demand, that is a really fast growing market on a global on a global scale. There and in, in, in connected TV, I mean, it really is something. I'm a little bit surprised it. We didn't hear this announcement from Amazon sooner. I like it. It gives consumers a choice. And I mean, if you're someone that uses the Amazon Prime uh, streaming service a lot, then maybe this is something you'll consider. Like, I'll say we use uh, a lot in our house, we use the Hulu Live offering. And we pay for the ad-free version of that, so that anything that we're streaming on Hulu, any of the on-demand stuff, we can just get all that stuff with minimal to zero ads. So I think it really just boils down to what platforms you use the most, to where you know is the value proposition going to be there. But I think generally speaking, most of these companies they don't want you to opt out because those ad-supported models can be can be quite profitable. Well, I mean, with Amazon especially, uh, advertising is a bigger and bigger and more profitable part part of that business already. It is, and you know, they distribute content in so many different ways, right? They've already got a little bit of this going with that freebie offering, right? I mean, that is essentially TV with ads right there. I mean, that's an Amazon property, and so this is just taking it one step further. So with Amazon, you know, I mean, they distribute content so many different ways uh, that this is just a natural fit. Maybe the three dollars is just to bring awareness to the idea that there's going to be ads. Who knows? That's a very good point. <laughs> One last Amazon question. Uh, I noticed on on the bottom of the press release, uh, I love to do that. The just walk out technology was on their list of the things that they are talking about. So this is the technology where you can basically go into the to the store, uh, pick stuff up, and and just leave. And you know, we surveyed surveyed our listeners last week on X. About seventy eight percent they said they're willing. They're willing to do it. Amazon has struggled with integrating this tech for a while. They had those ghost stores. You know, they tried this out with Amazon Fresh. That's not that that hasn't been going so well for them. Do you think the tipping point on this is coming soon? I mean, it could be. I mean, I feel like I, I kind of liken this to self-driving cars in that to me, it feels like the technology is on a much faster pace here than actually figuring out how to handle the tech as a society, right? I mean, we there, there's infrastructure uh, investments that need to be made. I mean, they're they're sort of educating the consumer, right? I mean, once you get kind of 
stuck in your old ways or your habits, those can be difficult to break. I mean, I think this is it's interesting technology. I would certainly try it. It's not like it's something that scares me, but kind of like that old trust but verify saw. I think I'd be going through my receipt to make sure I was getting charged for the right stuff. And furthermore, the store owner, I mean, in this case, whether it's an Amazon Fresh, whatever, but let's assume this technology gets, you know, rolled out to stores and shops everywhere. I mean, as a store owner, I have to imagine you're kind of wondering. I mean, you're just going to take this on blind faith that everything is getting charged. That can be a little bit of a leap of faith right there. And so that'll take a little bit of time um, ultimately to play out there. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I see it playing a role. I'm just not sure how quickly we're going to get there. I think it's going to take probably a little bit longer than maybe people think. Yeah, yeah. The the checking out thing is interesting because I mean now you know if you leave like the Walmart they 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 at least look at your receipt. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure if that would happen uh, if you're using the the checkout free technology. Well, and that would be the idea. The whole point is convenience and zero friction. Well, if yeah. you're going to introduce some friction and say there, well, check out free, but we're still going to check your receipt. Well, that's not really check out free then. So it's kind of false advertising. As a consumer, hey, you know, you're checking out. You probably don't really have much to worry about, and maybe you're not getting charged for everything. Maybe you are. Maybe you care. Maybe you don't. But if you're the shop owner, you care. You want to make sure you're getting charged for every single thing that that consumer is walking out uh, out with, and and and. Whether this technology can really do that uh, consistently, I guess, remains to be seen. Yeah, I think that's true. Thanks for your time today, Jason. Thank you. We just talked about Amazon. We think there are a lot of great companies out there that are back at levels not seen in years. And that's why our analysts have rounded up five companies that have dipped below 49 bucks a share. And we're giving away that list for free. You can grab your copy of this report, Five Stocks Under $49, for free at fool.com slash report. That's right, five stock picks, totally free. We'll also put a link in the show notes. Last week, the CEO of RCI Hospitality, Eric Langan, tweeted he was grabbing dinner at the Grange Food Hall in Denver and was happy to meet up. The company operates restaurants, nightclubs, and soon casinos. RCI shareholder Ricky Mulvey took him up on it and brought his recording equipment. Mulvey talked to Langan about consumer spending, capital allocation, and his journey to the CEO seat. I know you've told this story on on X or, or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. It's it's got to be an interesting journey to. Um, I think you you had maybe one club, and then to be the the CEO of a of a publicly traded nightclub, restaurant, gentlemen's club, cabaret business. Yeah, I mean, I started out, I was dating an entertainer, I was 19 years old. Uh, I, I got married and divorced at 19. Friends started taking me to a club to hang out, to try to, you know, keep my mind on my ex-wife had ran off with my daughter, so I didn't really know where my daughter was. So it was kind of, you know, I was young and crazy, and but they t- started taking me to clubs. club, so I started dating one of the entertainers at the club, and then didn't really like the way things were going there for her, so I decided to open up, we were going to open our own club up. And uh, sold my baseball card collection, opened up my first club. It was about 1,600 square foot, little tiny place, just sold beer and wine, no hard liquor. But then parlayed that into another club and another club. And now we have, you know, almost 70, went public in 97, merged with Ricks, who did an IPO in 95, uh, then bought out the founder in 99 and basically been CEO, chairman of the board since 1999. That's incredible. Yeah, we had uh, seven locations, I think, or six locations in 1999. So we have 70 locations right now. We have 14 different projects in various phases of construction. Our next one that will open will be in Stafford, Texas, which is a south uh, southwest Houston suburb area. Uh, that one should open in the next two or three weeks. We're building a flagship location in Rowlett, Texas, which is uh, between uh, Mesquite and Rockwall, right on the lake. I have a 3,800-square-foot outdoor patio, really fantastic location, part of a huge 108 acre or 180 acre i can't remember how big it is a development with you know all types of business there our neighbor's going to be uh margaritaville yeah. give you an idea jimmy buff is margaritaville so hotel and resort so one thing i've heard you talk about on on earnings calls is you talk about capital allocation more than a lot of publicly traded ceos right. and you've drawn inspiration from a, a book called the outsiders yes just maybe broadly, how that book has affected you as a as a as a CEO, and also how you just maybe generally think about capital allocation uh, at RCI. Well, in 2014, we were supposed to do this big acquisition, and I found some accounting irregularities I didn't like. 
the more I dug in, the more I realized there was some type of fraud going on. I didn't know what it was at the time. I found out about 18 months later when the owners were arrested for uh, money laundering. Basically, they were their, their sales didn't make any sense versus the inventories. I was watching the inventory, so basically on the one club, I finally when I when I finally said, okay, no, we're not doing this deal. They would have had to have been selling beer for about uh, uh, 120 bucks a piece. <laughs> wow, you know, and beers were like four four fifty back then, right? So I was like, how can you have this much beer sales, but you only bought this much, yep. right? You can't have you know you can't have a hundred thousand dollars in sales, and you only bought enough beer at your four fifty to make you know twenty thousand dollars in sales. So where's this other eighty thousand dollars in beer sales? Yeah, you're paying the tax. Yeah, you've you know everything looks normal, right, on the surface, but when you when I dug into their inventory uh, purchases, the actual purchases of the product, they didn't buy enough product have that much in retail sales so and i i'd been to the club multiple nights and it was always slow you know and then you know compared to the what the, what the revenue numbers they said they were making so it kind of threw me off uh so we walked that deal when i did my bankers who were getting ready to do a about 14 million dollar raise for us didn't get their six percent and so they started pressuring me hardcore no just buy it you can fix it you know what you're doing i'm like no there is i'm not paying for something that just doesn't make sense. This is not right. Something, you know, something's wrong here. I, I can't do it. And so we backed out of the deal. And so that we got in a big argument with them. I ended up firing all my financial advisor, fired the people that were raising money for us about mid 2014. And then about a month later, a group from California came out to me and said, you know, Hey, we've got a proposal for you. And they hand me this book and it's called the do nothing proposal. I'm like, I'm good at doing nothing. I, I like this. I, and I, you know, I, I open it up and it says, you should do nothing other than buy back your stock as long as your free cash flow yield is over 10%. And your free cash flow deal today is 32.6% or something like that at the time. The stock had, because I didn't do the deal, the stock had gotten, you know, had gotten beat up. And so I was like, hmm, okay. And so I started looking. I was like, you know, and then they're explaining to me how, the deals we had done in the past with equity had been the most expensive capital that we could use. And so because, because of the free cash flow yield. And so we started looking and really got me into it. So that's why I not started. And I was like, okay. So basically within, I don't know, probably a month I had, we had kind of settled everything down. We weren't, we stopped looking for acquisitions. We kind of closed down anything we were doing and we literally took all of our free cash flow every week and started buying back stock. So if I had five hundred thousand dollars in extra cash that week, I would call the broker on Monday and say, "Buy me five hundred thousand dollars of stock this week." I'll talk to you next Monday, and that was my job for the week. So, like I said, I was really good at that, doing nothing. As we did that, you know, we we started buying back lots of stock. If you look, originally we were fully diluted basis, we had ten point eight million shares outstanding. And uh, today we have 9.4. We've used half a million on one acquisition, 200,000 on another acquisition. But the 200,000 that we used at $80 a share on this Slack acquisition in March, we bought back at you know an average price of $65 a share over over the period of time after the uh, after we did the first acquisition. So we've been very lucky on and timing and following just following the strategy. It it really works. So if we we set a hurdle rate for ourselves, if we're gonna Invest money. If our if our free cash flow yields at ten percent, then we want to anything money we invest that's not buying back our own company. We want a twenty five to thirty three percent return on cash on cash. And you know I don't worry about levered returns. We have bank financing now. Until two thousand seventeen, we didn't have bank financing. Everything was cash or, or seller financing or or super high interest. You know, twelve percent, fourteen percent money from hard money lenders. So that's really changed the ball game for us uh, between two thousand seventeen and now. And like, if you look at our stock today, I, we close at a 52 week low today, which, you know, I'm, I'm just in shock over because, I mean, I guess not really because we've been, we've been weakening and people have misunderstood or are misunderstanding where we're going because they're looking at our post COVID numbers. And I say, I tell everybody, we got to throw the last three years away. There was no normality to anything. There was no seasonality. When in the summertime, when numbers were supposed to get down, we start running record numbers. When the numbers were supposed to go up, our numbers were off. It's like there's no normality to anything because you know you get open and then we get close COVID closed down. Then there'd be another scare. Oh, we got to put your mask back on. Oh, you got to do this. You got to. And so there was no real normality. And and especially like the restaurant side, you know, if you look at the restaurant association, what they say, like 40 percent of mom and pop restaurants and went out of business during that that two year three year period of COVID, right? And what we've had in the last 12 months is new operators leasing all those buildings or renting all those buildings, opening new stores. So we had the big bump because everybody was closed, 
then we get this dip because now everybody's reopening different stuff, but it's new. And when anything's new, it has a honeymoon period. That's why if you look at most restaurants, including bombshells, we don't include them in same store sales for 18 months because the first six months are abnormal numbers, you know, because you're, you're boosting because you're in your honeymoon period. And so we were going against outrageous comps from a year ago and getting hit by all these new places opening up there in their honeymoon periods that didn't take just their, their business back, but took a little bit of our business as well. And, you know, we probably could have been a little quicker on raising some prices and doing a few other things. Uh, at the same time, we had labor squeezes, so we had lots of overtime, so our labor costs got out of out of whack. Food costs were fluctuating. So, you know, we, we played these games. So right now, Bombshells is running, I think we had a 15% margin. We had 12.9% the last quarter. Uh, I'm not sure what this quarter is going to be. We did raise some prices in at the end of June, so this should, should help and stabilize. I think, but we should be back to our 18 20% margins. But what people were looking at before was 28% margins, 32% margins. And you can go back and listen to earnings conference calls. I talked to one of our largest shareholders and he'd say, Oh, you know, we can extrapolate this out. And you know, over the next three years, you're going to, I said, no, those margins are not doable on a long-term basis. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that often affects stocks is when a wall street analyst uh, has to change his or her model. And you must be in a tough environment where your the denominator isn't going back to 2020 or 2021 levels. Now it's at 2022, the, the post-pandemic reopening boom. And I, I would say a lot of not long-term investors, but traders are just looking at that one year same store sales number. Well, if you look, it's computers that are selling our stock. Yeah. Right. Either, I can't remember if it's Dimensional or Renaissance, but they're both computer ran funds, right? Computers do all the buying, all the selling. Uh, and they, they, you know, they're net, they were net seller in the last quarter based on their 13F filing of 300,000 shares, uh, which is a huge part of the volume for that quarter. And so, you know, I look at the, I look at our shareholders list and I look at the 13, you know, our, our, the humans that own our stock are holding it. The computers are doing a lot of the selling right now. And so when the computers run out of stock and they will, I mean, they're, 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 Counts are all time lows. I mean, at one point, Dimensional owned 985,000 shares of the company, which, because of our buyback at that time, you know, that same quarter, we bought back a bunch of stock. And so they ended up being, you know, a little over 10% of the company. So they, I'm sure they sold immediately after we filed, sold down to under 10%, but they also kept right on selling. And, and they've continued to sell. So you can look at their 13 Fs, like I said, and see that they're very, very small portions of our, of our holdings now. And as those computers run out of stock, eventually, we will turn, uh, I think, in, in, as early as first quarter 24, which is our October, we our fiscal year, so maybe October, November, December. So by February, the computers you know, could flip because we started down about mid-October last year. The blue-collar customers started getting hit in mid-October. Uh, we stabilized that customer by April, and then in May, our high-end customer started planning European vacations, Mediterranean vacations. And this summer, our super high-end customer, all, as in the casino terms, they call them whales, but our big spenders were all gone. They're all out of the country. And so we saw a, our big tickets just shrank. I went to, you know, went from 25 plus a week to, you know, at, you know, 5,000 plus to one a week. At, at one of our top locations in, in, in the country. And so we started looking, it's like, wow, we're really being affected, you know, to the tune of a couple million dollars uh, this quarter uh, of top-end customers. And that top-end customer is, you know, VIP room, uh, you know, high-dollar champagnes, bottle services that are super high margin for us. So not only did we lose the total revenue, but we lost a much larger share of our, you know, of our, our bottom line margins uh, through that. But they're coming back. You know, they're back from vacation. Kids are back in school. Weather's changing. You know, it's getting dark earlier, and we'll start seeing that customer. And I, I really think the turning point is this next quarter, uh, and for sure January, February, March. So sometime between February and May, all those computers are going to switch their models. Oh, you know, the quants, as they call them. And the quants are going to go, oh, we better start buying the stock again. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the stock will rebound pretty nicely, especially as we continue to get out on X and, and get out and, and put humans in the stock. Uh, you know, we hired Equity Animal out of New York to, to bring us in, and we went from a little over 6,000 shareholders to a little over 9,000 shareholders now. Sure, smaller shareholders, but, you know, I always say it's real simple. I need, you know, 
900,000 people to buy 10 shares, or I need 90,000 people that can buy 100 shares, right? Or, or 9,000 people that can buy 1,000 shares. And so I, I just started playing it as a numbers game. I used to be in door-to-door -door sales as a kid, and I started, let's, we just got to knock the doors. Let's just keep knocking doors, knocking doors. Uh, and, and it's working. We're seeing those shareholders come, and... You know they're they're holding they're they're buying they're holding yes the stock was ninety something in January, uh, you know it's back down to sixty the market's up fifteen points we're down thirty percent, but we were also at an all time high in January right I mean I mean not just not just a fifty two week high I mean all time like we'd never traded at the at that at that valuation before. And uh, so I always thought it would return to the mean. I, I thought it would the stock would say between seventy and eighty. Uh, when it dipped below seventy, I was kind of surprised. We held sixty eight for a long, long time. Uh, we finally broke through that sixty eight support recently, which according to charts, a quant chart puts us at sixty four. We've now broke through that. So the next support level I think is fifty eight. So we'll see if we can hold fifty eight here. Uh, I mean, I like I said, the humans that I talk to. Or, and the people that have known me for a long time, they're all calling me and saying, hey, is your stock a buy? I said, you know, look, based on our cap allocation strategy, you can do the math. And, you know, we're, we're, we're buying. And I put it out there, you know, pretty publicly that basically we buy about $100,000 worth of stock a day uh, as part of our deal. We don't buy every day. And, and, and sometimes we do. It really depends on our total cash and where we, if we have places to put that cash, you know, if it's a 10 or 12% yield, but we have places to put it that we think we can earn 30% plus, it makes more sense to invest it at a 30% plus ratio. But we get a certain amount of cash on our books, which typically right now that number is about 25 million. If we're over 25 million in cash on the books, we will buy every day. If we get between 20 and 25, we'll, you know, we may skip a day here or there trying to let it catch back up. For the humans invested in RCI hospitality, how do you want them to judge the health and growth of your company? Well, I think you have to look at 2023 as a growth year for us because we didn't do any acquisitions. We did acquisitions, but we didn't do any new builds. Like we didn't build more bombshells. Uh, we, we found these casino properties. We're building three nightclubs right now, Fort Worth and, and Lubbock, Texas. So we have some clubs under construction as well. So with all these projects, there's there's a lot of, you know, I call them anchors. There's some, or some drag, right? There's drag on stuff. So, so our, our, you know, our margins, we, we shoot for 30% EBITDA margins, 20% free cash flow margin on total gross revenues. And we were at 19 and change, and we hit 29 and change in this past quarter. But there's a lot of drag on with all these projects that we're doing, you know, architects being paid and, and attorneys and, you know, carrying costs for whether it's property taxes or utilities. And so there's a lot of little things out there that we're spending money on. Uh, travel uh, to go to these sites and meet with people and get construction started and get the GCs working. All that's going now. And it was really because of COVID, we stopped, right? We got closed down. We didn't really know what was going to go on. We finally got some stuff open in May. We struggled for that six to eight months, you know. Uh, and then we finally got open. We, and we started doing so good. We were so busy that we didn't really have the time to go hunt new projects. Uh, but then, you know, last year we started hunting the projects. Uh, from the time we start to the time we open is typically 12 to 14 months. Uh, so the first one will open, you know, in October that of this of these 14 that are in line right now. We'll probably open six or seven of them this year and six or seven of them in fiscal 25. And I don't have to look for anything right now until the end of calendar 24. Mm -hmm. So after December 2024, early, mm -hmm. early 25, I'll start looking for stuff that's going to open in 26. You know, we're in pretty good shape there, and I think as these things come online, the drag goes away, and they start income producing. Uh, we're going to be back in. If you look at our five-year KGAR rate through June 30th, we're at 20% free cash flow per share growth uh, in the previous five years. That's through COVID. I think overall, you know, our, our growth has been solid from when we started the capital case strategy eight years ago. We were doing $15 million in free cash flow. I project that uh, 2024, we're going to come in over $70 million in free cash flow. So, you know, that, that's not bad growth for, for an eight-year period. In my opinion, I'll, I'll take it. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about. And The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Deidre Woolard. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.